Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 60, Start of Fall, Answer All. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here on Twitch in the lobby. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Now, today marks our first monthly AMA episode. This is something we're going to try to do once a month on the last Wednesday of every month. We're going to be answering your gaming and game night questions live. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we received, comments on our content, maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word. Up first, a comment on our Tyrants of the Underdark review from last week. Gene Chu writes, This is my favorite deck builder. The direct player interaction element is what really sets this apart from other deck builders. I have to compete for control of territory against other players, so you have to assassinate their troops. You also get points for each troop you kill. Another thing that sets this apart from most other deck builders is that I usually cannot tell who will win before all the points are counted up. Many other deck builders, I can often tell who will win partway through the game. The many ways of scoring, where only about a third is readily visible, makes the winner not so clear during play. I'm glad you finally had a chance to play it. I do agree the component quality is really lacking. The color choices were poor, especially. It's hard to tell the dark gray and dark purple pieces apart in less than ideal lighting. I had to add white highlights to the dark gray pieces so they stand out more. Well, thanks for your comment, Gene. Now, Emmett O'Brien had a short comment about last week's podcast. He quotes Mo saying, Robotech is up there with Star Wars in my, chi- in my childhood. And then he commented, I like you more and more, Mo. <laughs> well, thanks, Emmett. I guess say Robotech, one show when I was a kid where I actually got up early before school, like early in the morning to watch. It was on channel 56 from Detroit at like 6.30 in the morning, and I would actually set my alarm and get up early before school to watch Robotech. I don't set my alarm to get up early to watch anything anymore. I guess part of that's probably because you can stream everything nowadays. Last, I've got a comment on my Tonto Core review from Wayne Ladisseur. My main problem with Tonto Core is when one person decides to start throwing those bad habit cards at another player. The other player has to retaliate or get swamped with negative victory points and lose, in which case now both players have to start throwing bad habits at each other or risk losing. The joke is now both those players lose and the other player wins by default. Well, thanks for the comment, Wayne. I got to say, we quickly learned after the first game that if you're using bad habits, never use them with, I think the maid's name is Claire, which is the maid that lets you defend against and get rid of negative events like bad habits. When we using Claire, we found it was like a, a made arms race to the game because someone would buy the first bad habit and then everyone would go into a Claire buying frenzy and then no one would bother buying any more events because they just assume the other player could defend with their Claire's. I strongly suggest if you've had this problem to at least if and I'm pretty sure the name's Claire, include the Claire card. And if it's not Claire, include a defensive card. And then those bad habits don't seem like such a big deal. All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in the chat room, the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around after we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show. So, we've already got some questions rolling in tonight. As we mentioned earlier, tonight is... The first of our monthly AMAs. Yeah, I didn't see a lot of other comments out there, except Jeff having some problems with a couple games, but they're also part of his question, so we'll get back to that. And while how Sean gets to hear Major Kayla pronounced in his ears every <laughs> night. Maggie? Maggie uh, Kayla? What was it? Maggie Kayla. 
Maggie Kyla. Maggie Kyla. Maggie Kyla. There you go. Maggie Kyla. I have to remember that. Uh, we're going to be back to the lobby like in a couple seconds. So <laughs> we'll get to your questions. And I hope you got some good ones saved up. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to come through to us is through the website. That way they don't get lost. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today is the last Wednesday of the month, and that means it's time for an AMA, or rather, Ask Us Anything. Uh, today we're answering your questions live. I guess this is probably an even better way than sending them to us through the website. We're going to be taking questions from our chat room, also from Twitter. Uh, if you see us on social media and hit us up, we'll try to catch them there as well. I think Sean's also got Facebook. And you're probably hearing this if you're on Facebook right now, but hey, fire away. All right. So up first, we have a question from Jeff Zeus. How many chances do you give a game that doesn't catch you on the first play? Well, depends how much it doesn't catch me on the first play. Um, there are some games that I, after one play, you can just tell are, are bad. Like they're terrible. They're, they're not worth playing again. Um, back when we started Extra Life, we used to get donations from a lot of companies who had funded stuff through Kickstarter. I'm not going to mention specific names. Now, in general, when I buy a game, I've done enough research. I very rarely get a flop. And when people ask me to play games, it's not usually something I've never heard of before. So there's usually a pretty good chance I'm going to like the game. So it's not often I get something totally foreign to me in front of me. And like I said, the best example that I can remember is these extra light packages that were showing up from a couple specific companies. And it was a bunch of Kickstarter games. And some of them were so bad. Like they would have something that I could tell why they funded like some really neat art or a really unique theme, but like you just had to play it once and realize there's nothing more there. Uh, there's a couple older games. I want to call one so bad called Tcholka, which we call murder sorry, which was a version of sorry, except one of the players, uh, there was a way when you capture people, you threw them out to the woods to be eaten by the dead God. And if you were losing badly, you can decide to start worshiping the dead God. And then one points for killing everyone. So we called it mur murder sorry, because that was pretty much it. That is one of the worst games I've ever played. I'll admit I tried that one twice just in case we were missing something because it was that bad. Sometimes you just know. But then other games, it's, I honestly think most, like if there's anything there, you should give it at least two shots, if not more. Now, when I'm doing reviews, I try to go for five before I get my final thoughts out there, just in case, because there's so many games that reward repeated play, where system mastery is a big part of the game. And actually, that's going to come up later when we get to the Tabletop Gaming Weekly segment. There were some games there that definitely weren't amazing on their first play. Well, and, and, another, and another aspect is uh, player count. Uh, yes. We talk about this a number of times, and we're going to talk about this again later tonight, uh, where some games really soar at certain player counts and fail miserably at others. Mm -hmm. uh, so you may have played it at the wrong player count. Now, unfortunately, one thing I'm seeing is we, we're talking about, you know, 8,000 plus games coming out a year. Mm -hmm. I would say that the majority of players aren't as forgiving. No, if, if they sit down and they have a, a, a really rough play with a game, they aren't going to go back to it. Um, again, it, a lot of it depends on who's, you know, if it's your game, if you've bought it, if, as Mo was saying, you've probably done that research in advance. But if you sit down at, a, at the FLGS and play somebody else's copy of a game and you really don't enjoy it, there's a good chance you're never going to go back to that game no. again and buying it's just right out the window. Yeah, very true. I say I, I, I like to give most games two tries, especially if I play the... I, you know what? To be honest, it's peer pressure in a way. It's, it's hype. If I play the game once and don't like it, but everyone I see on my Twitter feed or whatever is going on about how good it is, or when I post that I didn't like the game much, I get a bunch of people going, what do you mean you didn't like that game's awesome? Then I'll probably go around and actually give it a chance and well, be like, and, all right, I'll give it a second shot. And on that specific topic, Jeff had a follow-up. I want to love Scythe, but I tried it once and failed to find the fun. Same with Eclipse. And now Scythe is one of those games that people seem to love, but I know mm -hmm. you're the same way. You haven't really had the greatest love for no. it. 
But again, I, to be honest, this is one where I have literally played it once. The one experience I have a Scythe was not fun. I did not like the game. Now, I play enough games that I'm pretty sure I probably don't like Scythe. There's a chance it was the group I was playing with. But to be honest, it's the kind of game that should work with that group. It's not like we were trying to play a co-op game with the uh, with the Cho brothers, right? <laughs> we were we were playing a head-to-head race to the points, big mecha on the fields resource game, right? It was the perfect game for the group I played with. But Scythe is one I honestly do want to play again. I want to sit down and give it another shot because everyone seems to love Scythe. But the one time I played it, no, I did not like it at at all. Like it was one of the the worst games I played with that group of players because usually when I play stuff with them. Uh, Neil is very good at selecting games that are the type I like, and I expected to like it. So um, we need to get we need to get you and Jeff sitting down at a table to play yeah, side. And play side. There we go <laughs> with, with Mike Murphy. Mike Murphy just got the legendary edition, and he's having trouble getting through the rule book. So Mike Murphy will come over. We'll invite Jeff. <laughs> we'll, we'll sit down. We'll play side, and I'll see. There Everything go. I can tell about side is I liked Euphoria better, and that's the same designer with a similar race to points. And I I don't know. And that's, that's without getting into the problematic content of Scythe that we talked about a couple weeks ago. <laughs> now, Eclipse, I love. So um, I know there's games out there. Here's an example of a game that I did not like the first play. So one of the best examples of that, it's Portal Games, Cry Havoc. I was trying to blank on the name. Cry Havoc, Steve, I don't know his last name. Someone who comes out to many. Actually, I haven't seen him in months. He used to come out to a lot of our local gaming events. Actually, I wonder what happened to Steve. I'm going to have to ask Sean Hamilton because he knows him. Not Sean from Hamilton. And Steve brought this game, Cry Havoc, and I played it. The thing is, I played it having already bought it. So there was a good deal online, or it wasn't a Kickstarter or whatever. I'm sure it was just a good price. And I bought the game. Then I went and I played Steve's copy, and I was like, oh, this is not great. I, I am not sure about this game. This is, like, I like asymmetry. This game was so ridiculously asymmetric. I'm like, I don't even know what to think of this. It's a game all about colonizing a planet and exploiting it and doing terrible things to the indigenous species. And you played three different factions, and each of the factions was completely different. Like, they they had completely different units. They had completely different actions. They had completely different buildings they could build. Like, completely different. And what's interesting is four players, one of the players actually plays the indigenous species with a whole different set of rules because they're playing the indigenous species. And it was this area control game, and I was just like, I don't know, it's like too much stuff trying to happen at once, and I couldn't get the different factions, and I just couldn't see how to play it well, and I didn't understand how you could even enjoy this game, because it was just too much different stuff happening. But then my copy showed up, and I'm like, well, I bought it. I, 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 could, I guess I could just sell it sealed, but I'll give it a shot. And the second game, I played the same faction, and at that point, it was one of those oh, wait a minute, now that I've seen what the other factions do, I kind of get it. I'm like, oh, wait, the robots are supposed to be doing this, and the humans are supposed to be doing this, and I don't remember what the other guys are. There was robots, humans, and whatever the blue guys are. Um, And they're doing that, and I'm like, oh, now I'm starting to see the interactions. And I actually found the game so much better that I put it on my 10 by 10 list. It was one of the games I wanted to play 10 times because it really seemed like it was going to reward that repeated play. Now, interesting enough, that swapped around. By game six, I was sick of the game. I I played it five more times after that, like six plays of my own copy. So I played Steve's copy, I played my copy, then I played my copy five more times, and after playing five more times, I found that it just wasn't fun, and one one of the races seemed ridiculously overpowered, which is actually what broke that for me. Which I guess there's an expansion that might fix it, but eh. Eclipse, though, I love. So I'm going to have to, I might have to get Jeff out to play Eclipse sometime, but I sold my copy waiting for the new Kickstarter, <laughs> which should have been here by now, and it's not. All right. So up next from Major Kayla, we have <clears throat> there are a lot of board games out there come linked to popular media, movies, or what have you. What are the best and worst, you know, media driven games, or at least media themed games you've played? The worst is Labyrinth, Jim <laughs> Henson's Labyrinth. Oh my God. Like, I, I had heard that was bad. Here's a game that I knew was going to be a bad, but took a chance on because, oh, my God, I love Labyrinth. That game was terrible. There was not a redeeming quality in that game. I, I can't. The board ripped in half when I opened the box. Like, like it, it had die rolls for no reason and, and miss a turn and roll and move. And it, and then the worst part, you, you can go on the blog and read my review. The worst part is when I read the rule book, it almost sounded promising. Like, your characters had different stats, and stats were assigned dice. Like, it almost sounded like Savage Worlds, but then they did nothing with it. Like, it, oh, it was horrible. 
Best. Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, there are a lot of really good Star Wars games now. A lot. X-Wing is a fantastic miniature Starship battle game. Star Wars Imperial Assault is an awesome Rebels versus Imperial campaign game. Uh, Star Wars Rebellion, people keep calling Star Wars in the box. That, I've only played once. So I really, as far as I can tell, everyone's like, it's amazing. But it takes like three to five hours to play. And it's two player, best at two player. And it just, that doesn't happen. But when we played, Chewbacca became a Jedi. And that was pretty awesome. And, like, we blew up Endor because, you know, there were Ewoks there. Like, the, and you kind of tell the whole story. And what that game's about is one player is playing the Imperial, trying to find the Rebel base. And the other player is playing the Rebels, trying to hide the Rebel base. And they can blow up the Death Star. You can basically do all the stuff in the original trilogy. They can build the second Death Star. Actually, they can build the third Death Star in this one. Uh, like it's and it is a great Star Wars game. Uh, Star Trek Ascendancy is a fantastic Star Trek game where the humans can literally win just by going everywhere and being nice and people shoot switch pop over to their side. And of course, the Klingons win by being aggressive and taking people out. But like the Federation just shows up and it's like, we use diplomacy. Yeah, you join our side. Yeah, we use diplomacy. And then there's the Ferengi expansion, which I don't have yet, but it's all there's no money in the game, but it adds money in the game. And if you have the most money, even if the other races have won, you win the game because you're the Ferengi and you're rich. And there's a if you play with five players, some of the Borg starts in the middle of the map. It, again, it's like they say, Star Wars, it's Star Trek in a box. Well, and we also obviously know what uh, <coughs> what franchises Mo uh, prefers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to uh, jump around a little bit here. We had a question coming from the website. Corey Christensen asks, if you had to remove a game from your collection, which would it be? There you go. We're back to Labyrinth. That was easy. <laughs> game was dead. No, actually, I can't yet because I have an expansion for it. And the expansion's technically in the pile of shame. And Deanna keeps telling me, you just got to get rid of the game, get rid of it, go. And I'm like, oh, I got to play the expansion first. So good luck finding people to play with. All I'm right. going to jump back a second, though. What about you for for uh, movie-based games? I know you've done a few of them. Well, I know the worst, or, or I, the worst I own is unquestionably the Harry Potter clue. Um, oh. It was just horrible. I mean, that the mechanics in that, were it was it was it had so much potential and it was just so badly done. I mean, we haven't put it back on the table. We played it. I think we tried it twice. Maybe the maybe we gave it the third try, uh, and then it went into a bench somewhere and yeah. may never come out again. I no, um, not good. Uh, and then you know, again, for what I've done, I would have to say going way way back. One of my favorites is Vampire the Masquerade. Does Vampire Masquerade count as a as a as a property, I don't know uh, the Vampire of the Masquerade uh, card game, the original version. Yeah, uh, I don't know. there <laughs> I don't was know a TV series. As, yeah, so, uh, but there I guess the TV the TV series technically came from the, well, the yeah, game. From the so, game. Um, uh, right now, I it's kind of obviously DC. Although I can't really stand DC's properties in general, their games <laughs> at least work. Games. Have so, you played the Marvel Legendary? I have not yet. No. Okay, I couldn't. So, I don't own it because I don't like. Yeah, it, but. I just no, wondered, I, I, just to I compare just, the two. when I when I did the when I did the online comparison of how they played and things, it was my my son seemed to would uh, be likely more likely to enjoy despite his enjoy, his love of the Marvel properties, the DC gameplay better. So mm -hmm. that's why the way we went the way we did. Actually, we should we should spread that one out a bit. I know I'm I'm, I'm jumping over the other question about what you should throw out. What about RPGs? There's licensed RPGs. I'm trying to think worst licensed RPG I've seen. I know I played one and collectible card games because man, the old Star Trek collectible card game was amazing. And the, well, there were also some really bad collectible card yes, games. Yes, Deanna's right. I mean, right. RPGs, worst Masters of the Universe. Yeah, we well, should know yeah, that. Yeah, we've we talked about that enough times. Although, except my, I, I, I have this tendency to avoid that because it's not a game. That's right? true. It's it's just it, it exists. Plus it's a board game, but it, it's called the yeah. role playing game. Like that's in there, but it's, it's but it's not title. a game at all. Like, <laughs> they wanted it to be. But it just isn't. Yes. Uh, no. Real RPGs. I don't know. Oh, man. Star Wars Edge of the Empire, maybe? I can't say I've done Star too many Game branded RPGs. I, Babylon 5 was bad. I'm trying to think of it. My Little Pony seems impressive, but to be honest, I know it as a player. Like, my daughter ran it. Right. So I don't know how good the books actually are, but it seemed really good. Um, Elric, there's a good one. But I don't like the basic role-playing system. 
Um, All right. Yeah. Uh, other games I would get rid of. Um, uh, to be honest, there's not a lot. I don't. Pur- I, I'm going to purge for extra life. I do every year. I'm purging just to make room. Um, I'm trying to find the exact question again. If I had to remove a game from my collection, there's quite a few, actually. To be honest, there's probably about 20 games I could easily get rid of at this point. Mostly stuff I just don't play anymore. Um, there's a thing out there. It's called Jones Theory. And I don't know the guy's last name, but it was something, or first name, something Jones. And he posited that new board games come out. They make previous games obsolete. And there's no need to play that previous game anymore now that this new game's there. So they talk about how different games Jones theory out other games. So uh, an example is Isle of Sky is a tile lane game where you're matching things, getting points. Jones theory is Carcassonne for some people. I don't personally, it's close. I still play Carcassonne, so it hasn't Jones theory it for me. So there's games like that, right? Where I don't feel the need to play this anymore because I have a better version. So for me, Splendor. The only reason we're keeping is Deanna likes it and it's good for gateway games, but I see no reason to play Splendor when I can play Gizmos or I can play other of those small, simple engine builders. So interestingly, so Jones Theory, and I, I couldn't quickly find his name, uh, again, is uh, the main idea is that a game collection should contain no more than one game of the same type. But following on from that, you get the Richard's Postulate, which is if a game has not hit your table in a year, it shouldn't yeah. be in your collection. See that I'd, I'd have much less games if that was yeah. the case. For me, I could, I could probably go games that have been at least five years, and I might be at the point there's probably some games down there I haven't played in ten years. And then, um, well, there's also Norwood's theory, which is keep the games you like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know that that that's uh, the opposite, right? Yeah. Like part of it is is I'm a collector, right, for a while, but I've gotten over that a lot. I now throw out boxes, I recycle boxes, I don't keep the stuff for the expansions. But there's just, like, I can look around and go, you know what, I haven't played that in forever, and I have no desire. It's To be honest, it's the Mary Kondo thing. Really, it is. It's it's Does it spark joy? I look and I'm like, do I go, oh, I want to play that again? Or am I like, eh. And there's more and more in my collection that I look and I'm like, eh. Like, I picked a bicycle, right? Here's an example. Bicycle is a version of pitch card. But it has this thing called the Z ball, and inside this little ball, little marbles. So you can actually do stuff like put English on it and stuff, and it's really neat. But it requires way more skill, and it's really difficult for new players to play. And it's pitch car, and you only have the one ball, so you have to like put it behind your bike and move your bike and flick. And I'm like, pitch car is just so much more elegant and simple, and it's wood instead of a plastic track. I'm like, I, I like the concept of being able to play a skill based pitch car. Like, not that there's no skill required in pitch car, but, like, to be able to do, like, English and backspin sounded really cool. But, like, I am break that out. Pitch car. It's just never going to happen. Like, if I'm running a gaming event, it's not like there's a bunch of pitch car experts here in Windsor who are like, let's bring it to the next level. Like, it's just not going to happen. Yep. All right. We're probably spending too much time on each topic here. So next up, we have another question from the website. Ralph asks, what is the best gateway area control game? Ooh. I'm going to go way back. Here's a game that, that I probably have Jones Theory to out of my collection, but Clans, uh, I'm trying to think of even who makes it. It's like either Rio Grande or Mayfair. A new version of that's coming out. That is a really simple one so, where you're uh, just putting out huts. Zedman Games and Venice Connection are two of the publishers anyway. Okay. See, I had it before that, so it, it must be Z-Man now. It's 2002 uh, release. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's older. Uh, re-implemented by Fay F A E. Fay, that's it. That's the new one, F A E, which is probably just as good. But really simple game where you're just moving your huts and your gather. Your huts represent barbarian tribes or, or tribes of people, different clans, and you're grouping onto different colors. And each round, different colors are going to score. So you're trying to group your people in different spots. I think that one's a great gateway area control. Um, trying to think of other area control. Uh, yeah, I almost want to say King Domino, but that's not area control, but it's it's got the concepts of building your area and getting points, but it's not the control part because you're never playing against another player. But like to get that whole trying to build areas and score points for areas, El Grande is still the best area control game ever made, in my opinion. Actually, he's saying area control. Technically, it's area majority. Um, I'm trying to think of others. Kemet, but that's not that good a gateway game. Why I'm trying to think, what else do we have for area control games without Googling? See, I'm trying to <laughs> Googling. 
actually Google it. Are we trying to get real answers? Am I using the internet like I would if I was writing an article, or do I even <laughs> not use the internet? Uh, I'm not sure where we are going for. But I think we got. Just, I think we, I know, you know, we've got an answer there. We've definitely, we've definitely given an answer. I feel like I'm getting something good. That's that's what <laughs> trying like tyrants of under. I kind of want to say. Oh, we can come back um, to it if. Uh, I think small world, small world is probably actually you know what small world takes over. Small world is folk on a map counters, and the combat system is so simple. It's you count your counters, you count their counters. You knock off one counter from each side until one side has more, and that's who wins. And that's it. And like it's that simple to the fact that if there's terrain, that's just another counter, and it counts for the defender. So if there are mountains in the area, there'll be a little mountain chit, and you have two of your troops defending the mountain. Well, you have three counters. I have four counters. I take your territory. It is that dead simple. Um, really neat, asymmetric game where you have different races that are matched with types. So you could have like flying barbarians and aquatic elves and all this stuff. And as you expand out, you'll run out of troops. And then you have to go into decline, it's called. So you spend one turn where you flip all your people over. And then next turn, you come back into the game with a new race. And it's all, you score points for every area you control at the end of every round. And I think you play 10 rounds. There you go. I, I had small world for sure. All right. There we go. Uh, going, coming back to a Jeff uh, question from the uh, chat lobby. Uh, what games do you love, but find it impossible to pitch successfully to a group of players? Town Center is the one, the hardest. Town Center is this game where you're trying to represent building a city center using cubes, and the cubes grow. Like, it's hard to describe, see? Because <laughs> the cubes grow organically based on the rules, based on what's next to them. So if a shop has power and there's enough people in the city, it'll grow. And it can only grow if you have enough elevators. And the game is fascinating to me. It's something that Heavy Cardboard, Edward from Heavy Cardboard, got my head on to, like, pointed me at. Because it's you have to think spatially, which not a lot of games do that. And it's a heavy filler, thinky filler, where you have to think spatially. And it's all about drafting cubes, and then each cube represents different types of buildings, and trying to manage your power levels and set it up. Your city grows on its own. But you don't want to out because you spread to the suburbs those points. And like trying to sell that on someone and then bringing it out and showing it to people and they, they're expecting, you know, the climbers or something simple. And it's so not. So, yeah, that's a that's a big one. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see a game that's a 30 minute play time, but a 3.24 weight. Yeah. <laughs> that's it's, that's it's not wonderful. something you see like that's yeah. that's pretty rare. I love that game, but I can't get people to play. Like I really can't. Um, plus all the all the big ones, right? Like trying to convince anyone to play Twilight Imperium. I didn't buy it, Twilight Imperium Fourth Edition because I know, like maybe once a year, I'll get people to play it. And the nights I can play it are like New Year's, where I don't actually want to be tied up for eight hours because I want to play a bunch of different things with a bunch of different people. And I just we don't have we have kids now, right? Like we don't have the come over Saturday at six and we'll play till three in the morning just doesn't happen as often as it used to when we were younger. Yeah. I, even if the kids are gone, we are just older and can't necessarily get away with that. Or I can, but Deanna can't because she taps out way earlier than I do. <laughs> uh, so that's another one. Anything that's big like that. Um, and well, it seems like any more role-playing games of any sort, I can't seem to bitch to anyone. I'm like, come on guys, we're going to play Dungeon Crawl class. We're going to do this. Hey, we're going to play mouse guard. I don't know. Well, I mean, the, need a brand new group or we got to start playing online. Well, I think the big problem with role playing games is, I mean, just adult time management, right? An RPG takes a lot of time to do properly for, mo for the most part. You can't, you know, you can't get away with, uh, you know, oh, three hours this week and then a month later, another three hours. It just doesn't work as well. That's, need... that's pretty much where we're at with the, the group. Like, yeah, I right. get people on Mondays now, so that's which is a nice change from a few months ago. People have been coming out every Monday for the last few weeks, but it's not the same people every week, which is the problem. Like, it's the, yes, we could play one-shots every week, but I, the hard part is even playing with a one-shot, I never know until, like, an hour before exactly how many players I'm going to have, right. which is fine. Like, I, I realize that the people I am currently playing with have certain sets of obligations, and, and limitations that mean they can't let me know ahead of time, which is fair. Yeah. It's just, yeah, any, I, I can't, get, I, I could pitch every RPG. Uh, the, I bet, though I still swear, if I said we're going to restart our Warhammer 3rd edition campaign, or if I said we're going to start playing D&D, I'd have people. <laughs> so I, I swear that's there. Uh, so here we go. From, on, from Twitter, at Binks Games asks, what is your snack of choice 
And is it the same as your game group? All right. Uh, we had this as a blog topic, basically. It's come up a couple times for food and drink. And I went on about this. I don't tend to snack while playing. I, I, To me, the food part is separate from the gaming part. I know back when we were kids, yeah, there was the whole Cheetos, Doritos, bag of whatever, <laughs> and Jolt Cola and Spider Butter Bars and whatever. But anymore, um, we tend to avoid the snacks almost totally. We eat before playing, or even if I'm playing in a public place, I will take a break to eat. So, like, if we're at the CG Realm and we get Coney Dogs, I'll have them deliver Coney Dogs to another table. I'll wait till the game's done. Then I'll go eat my Coney Dogs, and then I will start another game. Like, it's, it, I tend to separate them. Now at home, now and then, we'll grab snacks. We are big on small finger foods being... Um, not finger foods, but like small snacks, chocolate covered espresso beans, espresso beans, or chocolate covered coffee beans. Generally, anything that's not sticky, powdery, or like gummy. Not gummy's not bad as long as it doesn't get wet. Um, wow. I there's these cluster cashew clusters you can get from Costco. I'm a big fan of those right now, and I eat an awful lot of raw almonds now, unsalted raw almonds, which again is all stuff that you don't really get can't get on the cards can't get onto the stuff but even that like it's like once every five games i'm sitting there i'm starving for some reason so i go and grab something as for other people the people we play with now don't tend to no i can't no one seems to bring anything back when we used to do fourth edition D D, we used to give like well not xp we had a whole fun point system where we gave points for people bringing snacks and that tended to be packages of things like a pack of oreos or a McCain cake <laughs> that seemed to be popular. But again, we tended to like eat that, then play. Right. Personally, I'm, I'm a salty snack guy. Uh, you give me um, flavored pretzels. I don't like plain pretzels, but give me the flavored pretzels or potato chips and I'm good. But that's a role playing thing for me. Uh, yeah. Board games. I've never felt the need to really snack. Um, it just, it's never a thing, but yeah, if I sit down at a, at a, at an RPG, I generally expect to have a bag of something near me just, you know, it's part of it's, and it, again, a lot of it's just habit from playing mm -hmm. years and years ago, where we would always have that you know crap food yep. around us. Crap food, yes, definitely <laughs> crap food. Um, you know, seven whatever we got from the Seven Eleven or the uh, yep. you know the local university uh, store. Even then, like break for dinner, like we didn't sit and eat hot dogs or pizza while we no, were no, playing. No, it was all it was snack food and snack and, and food. soda, you know, yeah, generally. Um, I wonder if that's part of it too. Like I said, we used to do it with fourth edition. So I don't think when we played, we played Warhammer. I don't think we did a lot of snacking. It could just be that mainly we're doing board gaming. And in general, I said with board gaming, we don't part of it too, with RPGs, you know what? I, I'm just, it just clicked into my head at the time with RPGs. You tend to only touch your own stuff. You have yeah. your dice, your pencil, your character sheet. And if you get Cheetos crap all over it, no one cares because it's all your stuff. Yep. And I wonder if there's an aspect to it because like, it's not and like, except for maybe passing around the rule book. No, that's very true. I, I never, I never considered that, but yeah, our RPGs do tend to be a very personal yeah, like space personal game. Stuff. Interesting. Uh, now we have uh nursey poo left <laughs> a question on one of our Gloomhaven actual play videos. They said, just played my first Gloomhaven scenario today. Well, congratulations, nursey poo. Any advice for a beginner? Tips or things that I can get the most out of the game. Thanks. Well, there's two guys on Twitter that did an FAQ review. I hear that's invaluable. I suggest checking that out. If you Google FAQ or YouTube Gloomhaven FAQ, you should be able to find it. It's by two guys, Mo and Sean. I, as far as I can tell, it's fantastic advice. People seem to love it. It's got like over 3,000 hits now. Uh, <laughs> uh, advice for a beginner in Gloomhaven. Um, don't play four player if you can avoid it. Seems to be a thing. Do not. Feel shamed for playing on easy. I think that's my biggest tip. The game is not easy. There are 45 pages of rules and lots of little details and idiosyncrasies and things to learn. We have played over 30 games and still mess up rules, as comments on our last video show. <laughs> we screwed up two things in our last game. Thanks to Mujin. Um, don't, don't, just, just. If you're get beat, don't get frustrated. Just try again at an easier difficulty. Uh, other than that, cards are your life. Like, 
realize that if you run out of cards, you you lose. Like, do not use those burn cards, the ones where you have to put them in your lost pile. Yep. If almost if at all possible, like save them until you absolutely need them. Um, use the Gloomhaven Helper app because my God, it makes the table a lot clearer and it keeps track of everything. Well, not everything. You have to do it all, but it's all tracked there, and you don't have all the counters everywhere, and you don't knock stuff over, and it's it's just much cleaner experience. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. That's pro that's probably the main ones. Yeah, I would say you know what I. And now this, this goes completely contrary to what you guys do on Friday nights. <laughs> but I would say, lay out the whole map. When you get to a scenario... That's actually by the rules. If you're, you know, let, don't, don't follow what we do on Friday nights. <laughs> actually put out that whole map. Read through, and, and really importantly, read through yes. the whole scenario. Yes. Because we've gotten burned a few times that, on that, where they put something in a strange place, and... You think you don't want to read that because you don't want to give something away. Well, you know what? Risk giving something away. Just get it all, get the map down, read through the whole scenario, and figure it out. Oh, that's good. We should, I think we should switch to doing that. Yeah. I it's interesting and dramatic, and it's just my role playing DM nature that I like. <laughs> I want no, to keep absolutely. it my chest and make it more interesting. And Tori and Kat find it more interesting, right? Uh, so. Absolutely. And, and I mean, to be fair now, I mean, that's the reason I got the rule book so that I can actually check ahead and double check for you. Um, all right. Yeah, well, don't, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Yeah. Um, realize you don't have to use the same party. Characters can come in and out. Try random dungeons. That's a good way to level up. Uh, lots of little things. Uh, and actually, and uh, Dee's pointing out in the chat room that uh, she burned out cards that she wouldn't have if she'd known the layout. Uh, now, interestingly, one thing that happens in the uh, digital version, the Steam version of Gloom, uh, at least on the what current what's currently available, they do not have scenarios available yet mm -hmm. on that, but it is a hidden map. Yep. And what's really annoying and has, kill and has actually killed me on some scenarios I've tried is the doors aren't obvious. Yeah, that's so I've gone the wrong way into a room, not knowing that I walked past a door and I couldn't get back before losing. You know, I, you know there was just nothing I could do. Now, to be um, honest, Isaac has explained that he wants it all to be hidden. Right. It just there was no way to present it that way. Right. Like there's no way to present the scenario without the book being three times bigger, having to do a separate page for every room. Mm. There was no way to present it in the book as it's meant to be that you don't know what's in the next room. So I wonder if it, I wonder if the campaign in the eventual release of the uh, we'll probably game have will hidden. actually have it hidden. Then, if that's if that's his wishes, interesting. As I said, the 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 playing it properly is the information is meant to be hidden. You're not meant to be able to count how many monsters are going to be in the last room so that you spawn enough so that they're not there and stuff like that. Right. Which you can do. You can metagame if you're looking at it or knowing that hey, there's traps in the last room, so I don't want to use my trap thing in the first room and there's only two traps because there's 20 in the next room. You're, the players aren't meant to know that. Right. Which is kind of why we are doing it the way where I know it and I try not to talk about it. Alright, moving on. We have a question from Ryan. Have you ever removed an expansion from a game, and why? I swear I have. There are, oh, there. Um, Lanterns, the Harvest Festival. Fantastic game. Love the fact that in that game, what you are doing affects all the players. And you play a tile, and you're going to get something for it, and so is everyone else. So the entire game is about trying to do the best for you without doing better. For another player which i think is really neat and it's a fun quick filler game rather nice looking i wouldn't call it beautiful but it's neat looking with all the flowers and the boats it's cool it's got some nice wooden components the expansion for that just muddied the game there was just too many more things to think about i added new components that weren't wood which just was lame versus the original like you have these nice wooden fate tokens and it added these new tokens that are cardboard um new ways to make combos and then new ways to score and end goals. And it just, it wasn't fun. It was more fun to play the base game. It, I'm sure some gamers found it better. So that's what it felt like is they tried to add complexity to up the weight level for people who like heavier games. And I don't think it was warranted at all. I preferred the base lanterns game to the expansion. Um, I haven't technically removed it, but I can't remember the last time I played with it. Now, more recently, many times in the last two weeks, 
I have removed and put back the escalation expansion from uh, Eminent Domain. So I will often, and this is true of almost every game I own, pull out expansions for teaching the game to new players for the first time, which I do a, a lot with the events I run in the city. So I pull the expansion cards out. Terrifying Mars. There's another example we'll get to in a second. So Eminent Domain, we're going to get to it in the week in review. I taught, oh, we played many times in this past week. Also, my friend Tom's over. We're playing. He hasn't played in three or four years. He had played it before. I'm like, whoa, we're going to pull that out. And then, then Tori and Kat come over, and I'm like, yeah, it's already out. Let's play again. Now let's put it back in. If I was going to teach Sean how to play in a mid domain, I'd pull it out again, right? So I've often done it for that reason. But even more so, like I said, the ones, Terraforming Mars, we've talked many times. Deanna hates Venus Next. I personally don't mind it. But I have pulled it out as well as other expansions just to speed up the gameplay. So often, especially at a public event, um, I did this two, three Two months ago, maybe it was a month ago, at easy mode, group of players, never played Terraforming Mars, showed up, I broke it out, I kept in Preludes because it speeds up the game. But then I also used the expansion rules where everyone, the basic rules where everyone starts with one resource because it also speeds up the game, but I pulled out everything else. I pulled out the new cards from Preludes, I pulled out the new, all of the Venus stuff, and I, I pulled out all my promo cards. Because they'd never played before, and I didn't want them to experience it, but I did use some expansions. And I often, like, Venus is literally its own baggie in Terraforming Mars. And when people stop playing, I ask that they please sort through the cards and take them out so that it's ready to play next time. Because I don't keep it in there. So th those are some good examples. So I have done it. It's not often. In most cases, 90, almost 80, 80 to 90% of the time, expansions tend to improve. I've found I'm, I'm usually a thumbs up to most expansions, but now and then... Okay. Not the case. Now, as a follow-up from D, what is your favorite board game expansion that you feel is a must-have? Galactic Orders for Core Worlds. I honestly think, I, I'm pissed at Stronghold Games for this one. It should have been in the box. Because you read the rule book and it points out, what are these symbols on this card? Well, they're for a future expansion, which means you had that expansion written. Why didn't you just include it in the box? Like it was purely for monetary reasons. I found that frustrating. I, I'm sure like Stephen Bonacor is pretty good, right? Like Stronghold Games, the man behind it knows his stuff. He probably did all the research and probably did the right thing, but it frustrated me to have what felt like an incomplete game and then to get the expansion and be right. Like it really did feel like it completed the game. And it, then it just more so is like, I'm happy. I, it's still literally my favorite deck builder. So it's not like I'm trying to bash the game, but I found it really frustrating that the game feels without it. So I will never, ever play that game without it. Um, I can't see playing Terraforming Mars though Prelude now, but I don't think it completes it. I don't think it's a, it, it's, it's close to a must have. I really think the game's better with it. Um, there's others. I know there are. But yeah, Core Worlds is the first one that comes to mind. Core Worlds with Galactic Orders. You can't play without Galactic Orders. And they put an expansion after that. I don't even remember the name of the uh, something throne. Yet that one, eh, take it or leave it. Adds for heroes. Again, I'm not Googling, so I can't <laughs> look up the name of the. I have it. It's in my game. The last two times we played, we played once with it, once without. But Galactic Orders, definitely. All right. So uh, another one from uh, Ryan here. Uh, to get a longer game played, are you willing to break it into multiple sessions? And what games have you done this with? And this is excluding RPGs, which it's kind of a given you're going to break up. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's generally given. Ah, uh, yes, it, uh, we've done it not often. Um, part of the problem is I do a lot of different stuff in my basement. I have a large table. I can leave games set up, but especially now that we live stream Gloomhaven on Fridays, that's less likely to happen. Before that happens, sometimes we play a game on Monday night and leave it up, set up till the next week. More often, though, Deanna and I will be playing something and we'll leave it set up. An example of that was Twilight Struggle, which is was the number one rated two-player game on Board Game Geek. Still might be, to be honest. Um, we definitely, that took us two games, two days to get through. Um, it, we do it now and then. I, I'm willing to do it, but there aren't a lot of games that are that epic that need it to happen. Um, I think there's one we did recently. What's more often is we'll fail a mission in Gloomhaven and just leave it set up to try again the next week. We did that before. We, we and Except we don't get the play when that happens and people cancel. 
Right. I mean, at this guy, at this point, uh, you know, we'll we'll uh, we'll conclude Gloomhaven with the RPGs because again, yeah, you're going to have to have to break that up over multiple sessions. See, with um, that one though, it's it's the leaving the tiles and everything set up, which isn't something you normally have with D and D. Yep. So uh, yeah, we we have, but we don't often play. Wait, we did it with a uh, colony, Co- the colonist colonies, the epic game. I think it's called Colonies. The, the uh, ridiculous <laughs> game with four different eras of play, and we played with Sean Hamilton. We left it up for three weeks. So yeah, we'll definitely do it because that's like a, a four-hour session per era, twelve-hour total. The Colonists, the Colonists. That's the name, the Colonists. Right. And uh, through the ages was mentioned in there too. That's another one where yeah, if you, I, I, I can I can imagine leaving that set up. I could imagine it, but again, usually like. I kind of said it earlier. When we have those big epic game nights, we plan big epic game nights, right? So we've done this recently. We did Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, and I did Zaya with Chad and Justin, two local gamers, where we set up a night to play. And we're like, you guys are going to come over. Come over for five. Make sure you've eaten first. At nine or ten, we're going to order some food in, and we're going to take a two-hour hour break, 45-minute break to eat, and then we'll finish the game. Which didn't end up being necessary for Twilight Imperium, surprisingly, because like that game was over in under three hours. I was really surprised by that, because everyone talks about how Twilight Imperium 4 is just as bad as 2 for length, and it definitely wasn't. That's a game I'd like to play again. But again, I don't doubt I'm going to buy it. Um... So, uh, moving on here, we have, uh, ah, here we go. Now, I think we've talked about this before, but it's worth touching on again. Uh, Joe Lemire left this question on the Bellhop blog. What was the first game you remember playing that got you into the hobby? All right, I talked about this one with Deanna before the show, because this one's really hard to answer. It's like asking someone, Sean, when's the first time you ate carrots? (laughs) Because, like, I grew up with board games, right? So I was thinking about this, I'm like, all right. Let me think hobby board games. I'm like, all right, hobby board games. I bought White Dwarf Issue 100 from, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the stupid Leisure World at Devonshire Mall. I was 12. And that got me into Warhammer and Games Workshop. And I bought Talisman. And maybe that's my first one. But before that, my dad owned Awful Green Things from Outer Space and owned Snit's Revenge. And I remember playing Awful Green Things from Outer Space with my grandmother. Or before that, my dad had Dark Tower, and I played Dark Tower with him. So really, I played, like, that game then, right? Like, I was playing those in, what, I was seven when Dark Tower came out? I was six or seven when Dark Tower came out. Like, just, we've all, my dad was a gamer, and, like, I have role-playing games. I got into TSR Marvel Super Heroes in 1985. Uh, but before that, my cousin and I, he had the D&D action figures, and he had a Commodore 64, and he had a game for it called Oubliette. And he had the rule book for Oubliette. And in the back of the rule book for Oubliette was all the rules for the map that was in the game. So we used to play with the D&D figures, but use the RPG rules. We didn't call them that, but there was really the role-playing rules for combat from Oubliette. And like, I don't know, how old were we then? I don't even know. Like, I, I was young. I honestly, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> like, I have no idea what, what the first game I remember that got me into. I was always in the hobby, I guess. Uh, yeah, I have to say, like, it's interesting because, I mean, the first hobby board game I played, I would have been crazy late in it. Uh, but, you know, I grew up playing so many board games. I mean, we had shelves and shelves and shelves of board games, which were, for the most part, mass market. But even some of those were a little more off the, you know, off the main shelf mass market. They were, I mean, uh, we weren't, my, my my family wasn't role playing or anything, but they were getting some some interesting games off of, you know, mm-hmm. from some of the some of the more specialty game stores, and yep. not just you know going to Toys R Us and and picking up games there. And and I've got some great fond memories of uh, sitting down and, and playing games with the family. Uh, you know, some of that 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 pipe uh, pipe playing game, that, Waterworks. Uh, Waterworks. You know, yep. is a, yep. a it's it's a, that's really a hobby game if you you know if, uh, it's if Parker you Brothers. It, uh, so, but it's but, Parker, yeah. it's Parker Brothers. It, but I mean the 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 mechanics and things like that is yep. a little more on the hobby game side. My dad had peak oil, I think it was called, where you'd move the little oil things to see if you struck oil. Like, it, it was just always a thing. Like, yep. I, which I'm sure for some kids nowadays it's the same thing. But like, everyone always gives me a dirty look when I answer that way, and I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, I just grew up with this stuff and never really stopped. Uh. So next up we have all right. 
So we all know your thoughts on the Master of the Universe role-playing <laughs> game from FASA. If you were going to actually make a He-Man RPG, uh, oh, let's say let's include She-Ra in that. So we, you know, yeah. all of all of the uh, the universe. What system would it be powered by? Uh, they already exist. It's called um, Cartoon Action Hour. So I don't know that that's supposedly the system to be used. Um, I don't know. D and D would probably work. Out of the systems I own, I don't know. I can't think of anything great that I would use. Like, what's iconic about He-Man that's not just generic fantasy? He had laser guns. Like, what makes a He-Man? I can't think of anything that, that any generic fantasy system wouldn't cover. For Like, I, everyone had their unique thing. So, okay, so maybe we're looking at, I think it's 13th Age. I think 13th Age is the system where every character has a unique thing. So you could be, say, the last of the dwarves. And this thing is always universally true for you. That, that this this is a true thing. I, I could see that because you had, you know, Ram Man and Fisto and like they all arms, they all had a specialty, even if it was just like a giant flipping gun and fist to punch people with, or I can headbutt people. But like they have to have that. So you have to have a shtick. You have to have that. Fate would work for that reason because that would be your, your high concept, right? Your main aspect. Um you know what would probably work is a hack of Iron Edda Accelerated. You'd start off with like instead of your hold fast creation, it'd be like your Greyhawk, like whatever I don't Eternia creation, like your your city. You'd make your city, but then you'd have to find something to replace. Like, like you wouldn't have the Bone Giants, obviously, but like the rest of the you'd have to have a different set of rules. But some of the aspects he had in there, especially with the scale, where you have the the human scale and then the godlike scale, so you'd have your one thing that would be at the step up, right? Like yeah, so. Yeah. Ram well, you Man wouldn't, you wouldn't need. Things. You wouldn't need size as a scale. It would be power level. No, no, power scale. level. Power yeah. level. Right? So like, you, like, you wouldn't like, need you wouldn't need your bone giants and your 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 dwarven uh, mechs. Your dwarven destroyer. Um, no. Because it would be it would just it would be, be you know scale. the person you know the the sword is that you know scale it is that you know yeah. you've got if whoever has both halves of the halves of the sword put together yeah, gets, the gets the ultimate game. power. You know that's or what it, it, I don't know if God lights before epic. Yeah. yeah. Sword. But uh, yeah, crazy. Yeah, something like that would, would definitely work. You just throw out the size aspect because size isn't important. It's all about pure power level. Yeah, I think uh, Fate Accelerated might work or some hack of Fate Accelerated. I can't see it being empowered by the apocalypse. Like I just don't see it being that narrative a game with the fail forward. Just doesn't seem like a human thing to me. I uh, Swords Without Master might work where you get to be a badass and be challenged. Uh, how well would uh, um, Game Park? Um, eh, it works for everything, but it's a little too generic, I think. Yeah, okay. Like, there's nothing about, like, you could do anything with it. Right. It's like saying, yeah, we could do it in curbs because you could, <laughs> of course. Of course you could. Um, all right. So another question from the website. What are your thoughts on other game experience enhancing products? Sound music for the years, we've talked about a bit, but uh, <laughs> candles for scent, game-related snacks. This is from Owlbear. You know, I love the concept of it for role-playing games. That's why I bought the Hue Lights, right? Like, that, that is literally why I did it. It's why I dig Sirens games. It's why I put on tabletop audio every time we play Gloomhaven now. And I just put on that background cistern sound of the dripping water and the weird sound effects. Where I put on one the other day that was called, like, Mechanical Chains, because we were in that one lab. And I try to find a different soundscape every time we play. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. Though I gotta admit, there's a metagame aspect that definitely brings you out. Right, like it's awesome to have the dramatic. The orc's about to cast a spell and everything turns green, but it's not so dramatic when I'm like, "Wait a minute, okay," and everything turns green. Right, like there's that pause. And for those of you listening at home, I just grabbed my phone and pretended I was playing <laughs> with it. Forgot the fact that there are people just listening. Um, the candles I so want to review because, in the sense, like there are these things where you can get these little, like they look like little gels and they're scentsy or whatever, and you're supposed to pass it around. I love the concept of, but I just worry they're going to like work one session and be gone. Like the scent won't be strong enough, but I love the concept of having like the stable scent and like opening it under the table and just seeing people notice, or you're having the campfire. I like the idea, but man, every company that sells them, they're ridiculously expensive. And like I said, I, it, I don't want them for, I don't want it to be a one stick gag. Like I want to be able to get this thing and be able to open it up and use it over 20 sessions. And part of the problem is well, I don't role play regularly enough. If I'm only going to play every six months, I'm sure my scents aren't going to last that long. 
Yeah, and one of the problems, like like Sensi is a great product uh, for you know making the the uh, the place your how your house smell a little nicer, but yeah. it's not something you can really swap. So you can't you know if you're changing areas, you can't quickly change the scent in a room. Yeah. You've 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 scented the room, mm -hmm. uh, so I can see it being great as a sort of a general ambiance for yeah. the entire session. But uh, you know, again, I mean, yeah, I suppose you could do the pass around a bottle and sniff from and, and oh, you're yeah, from the bottle. A, one company, they're little like things that are I don't know about an inch in diameter, and you're supposed to pass them around. But it just hey, here's what the dungeon smells like. It's a little weird. Yeah. But that, like I could see it for the right, like, especially if it was important to the story, like you open the door and you smell this, I right. could see. But then you need a specific scent, like, and it should be, probably be a clue to some kind of mystery or something, right? Like the, it should be a re repeating scent or something. Yeah, I, I, I have a hard time with uh, here, smell this now. Uh, again, unless it is a, a vital hint sort of thing. Right. Um, I could I could definitely see if you were doing a detective style uh, yeah, something, right? and, you know, and hey, you find a clue, sense, here's right? your clue. Uh, and, you know, and, and he keeps coming up. But, uh, you know, otherwise, again, a sensi ambience type thing, I can definitely see it. I mean, you want to be careful because you don't want, uh, you know, 16th century English sewer. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's not something anybody wants to smell, even oh, if that's the, those. even if that's the accurate scent for the, yep. for the game, you don't want that. Um, but, uh, yeah, you can definitely, you know, even if it's just something like, you know, very subtle, uh, yeah. I can definitely see a, a benefit for that just to keep, you know, again, add to that mood, add to the ambiance, you, the low, the lights are, the lights change a little bit. The scent comes on. You've got a little bit of background music, and again, it's not you know the dramatic action music. It's just that ambiance where you you feel a little more in a place. And then gaming related stacks, I always like the concept of I the, the closest I ever did to it. Uh, I'm gonna get in trouble for for stereotyping here. Is uh, I took fortune cookies when we played Feng Shui, and every time someone used a stunt, they pulled a fortune cookie, and I put modifiers in it so you crack the potion cookie and get something cool right. but i like the idea like i know people who have done like they've done you can get cookbooks for all the things right so you can get like harry Potter. if you're running a harry potter rpg having butterbeer stuff like that yep. i love the concept yep. but i've never done it and it's and we, i mean we've talked about theme nights and so you know you, yep. you can do that whole theme night uh game idea uh they're just talking about uh the 1890s thames uh scent <laughs> Uh, my first thought when they said that was uh, when we were playing Birmingham, you can have the scent of brass. Yes, brass Birmingham. Well, that's a burning coal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Brass. There is nothing that would be pleasant about that scent. Um, that, that would be easy, uh, eagerly avoided. Uh, now, I think we're going to uh, probably wrap up on this question. Skeeter asks, any recommendations for cooperative games for kids for family games nights? Now we've covered this in general, but uh, have you got any further or, or new thoughts on cooperative uh, games for kids for family game nights? Yeah, it's still Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. I still have not played anything better than that game. I still haven't tried the expansion. I, I have no gaming budget anymore. <laughs> uh, it's been available. It's out there. I haven't seen it cheap. I do really want to try the expansion, but just the base game is fantastic. Um, my kids still love Outboxed. Personally, I don't think that's great for families because it's if you're an adult, you can do logic well enough that it shouldn't be a problem for you to be able to solve it a little easy. But if my kids still love it. Um, trying to think of co-op games that I play with my kids. Not a lot of co-op games. Um, Flashpoint Fire Rescue. Um, I still mind. actually have that with my kids. I had a chance to sit down and play it with them. I still think would be good. I can't think of anything new that's co-op that I played. Unless I'm drawing a complete blank here. I'm like, go cuckoo and king of the dice. All the newer kids, all the kids, games I played with my kids recently have not been. Wait, wait, stuff fables. There we go. There, there's a recommendation that I don't think existed back when we did episode two. Uh, stuff fables is a game where you are playing the stuffed animals, protecting a girl from the monsters under her bed for her first night going to bed in a big girl bed. Uh, Epic story game, very well done. Which way elements looks like it's going to be a miniature combat game like Mice and Mystics. See, Mice and Mystics was an old recommendation. Scratch that one. 
From Ice and Mystics, I would save that for when the kids are teens, or at least a little older, young teens, and play stuff fables, much more accessible to kids. And it's not all combat. It's like the second part of the book is like you're bouncing down a hill of toys in a Red Rider cart and do you fall out type of thing. It's it's like skill challenges from 4th Ed D&D. With color-coded dice, even my youngest could get it. So there, yes, I do have a new recommendation, and I want to scratch one off the list because I actually think um, – Mice and Mystics is too complicated for kids. I push that on my kids too early. Uh, they may be old. I'm sure the oldest is old enough now, but the youngest probably would not still have difficulty with Mice and Mystics. Oh, uh, that's right. Talisman one. That's right. Um, Tiana mentioned that in the chat. Talisman Legendary Tales? Legendary something. Legendary Adventures? <laughs> Talisman Legendary Tales? That's what I get for not having to be able to Google. There you Talisman go. Legendary something. Um, from Pegasus Spiel. I remember that. That one was neat. Uh, we've only played it twice, so we need to play it some more, but the girls seem to really dig it. Just realize when you're buying the game, it has an I Spy element, which I really wasn't expecting, where you have to find things on the tiles. And with my big table, that doesn't work so well. It's really hard to see from across the thing, and we basically had to end up tearing apart the map and passing around the tiles to be able to look at them. Uh, except for that, it was interesting. There's some really weird stuff, though, because I don't think it's as replayable as they seem to think it is. There's five scenarios. And you don't get, and you pick which difficulty to start at. I think it's one through three. It might be one through four. And you don't get to unlock the next scenario until you have so many stars based on your level. I don't understand why you even have level one. Because to unlock st scenario two, you have to have two stars. And you've only unlocked one scenario. So if you play at level one, you then can just play again at level two. Like, it, I honestly don't understand why, like, the minimum wouldn't be the minimum level. Right. And and you also can't jump ahead. So I'm not sure why you would play at level three to start because you only need two stars to unlock the next one. Now, at the end, there is a final score and it's you add up all your stars. So I can kind of see why you might want to do the higher level. But it, it just I found it weird. It like reminded me of like, you know, how you get stars when you're playing apps. And I'm like, but if you only get one star, you don't get to advance. So you have to play again. But uh, there's just not didn't seem to be enough that was randomized that it would be fun to play multiple times. Right. But I've only played it uh, uh, like uh, twice, well, once and a half, one session of it. So it's one I, I still owe them a review on. I need to play more with my girls. But yeah, it's, it's good enough. Uh, to be honest, it's really cheap right now because I don't think it did well. So for the price you can get it for now, I think it's worth it. For full price, I don't. All right. Well, that was Talisman Legendary Tales. And that's it for this month's AMA. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. We are all about answering your questions, and it doesn't have to be during one of our live shows. If you've got a question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive the Tabletop Bellhop weekly email in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email that recaps all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, videos, reviews, anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Join us Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, and watch the Tabletop Bellhop team do some live streaming. Uh, tomorrow, for those of you here live, Sean and I are going to do a Terraforming Mars FAQ read-through and see if it happens to be as popular as their Gloomhaven one. Though there is a heads up, we may be starting a bit late. We're going to aim for a 9 o'clock start, but it might be a bit later. And uh, the week after that, we're probably going to be doing some more gaming. So uh, we haven't determined yet whether that will be uh, of the stream or uh, uh, Steam or Board Game Arena, but uh, more than likely, more games. The road to extra life continues. Uh, this past weekend, some fellow local gamers and I were at the Windsor Comic Con, held at Caesars Windsor, a big casino here in Windsor. Uh, we were there doing demos of games, trying to get the word out about our extra life events and raising some money. 
We raised $214 at the event and want to thank everyone who stopped by the booth and said hi, played some demo games, and donated. Now, up next, we've got the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz that's going to hit on Saturday, October 12th. This multi-round board game tournament will run from noon until 10 p.m. and will be held at the CG Realm at 1311 Tecumseh Road East in Windsor, Ontario. The cost to enter the tournament's 10 bucks, half of which is going right to Extra Life. So half your money's, 100% of half your money is going to Extra Life. The other half, though, is going to go towards prizes. Now, the prizes this time are going to be in the form of CG Realm Store credit. Now, Jeremy, the owner of the store, has made a generous offer of taking that half and adding 20% to whatever we get. So the more people that enter, the bigger the prizes are going to get. So come out and enjoy a night of gaming or a day of gaming for a great cause. <sighs> Up next, we've got a review of the Harry Potter Funkoverse game from Funko Pop. All right, I don't personally get it, but I, everyone loves Funko Pops. People are going nuts for these things. I I really don't understand. Like this, this is as big as Beanie Babies, if not bigger. Everyone loves these silly Funko Pop things, and the Funko Pop people this year at Gen Con premiered a bunch of games, which they're not allowed to call board games because of the licensing. Because Marvel already has board games, and DC has board games, and Harry Potter has board games. They are the Funko Verse strategy games. Today, I'm going to share my thoughts on the Harry Potter number 100 base set. Now, I will point out, I, I, I don't get it. I don't understand why people like Funkos. Uh, I guess they're kind of cute. I don't get the mass appeal. Sorry, collectibles, uh, collectors, whatever. I don't own any Funko Pops. I don't plan on buying any Funko Pops. But, eh, whatever, to each your own. If you love and collect them, the power, all the power to you. I just don't see the lure myself. See, I get the basic concept. A cool bobblehead-ish uh, figure of some character or figure you like. A few on your desk or your dashboard. You know, if you're working in a cubicle at the office, great way to sort of let your geek flag fly. But things get out of hand in the Funko world. Mm -hmm. 8,000 characters <laughs> seems excessive, particularly when some of them are duplicates of the same person. There are 29 versions of a late night talk show host Funko Pop okay. I, that that just gets a bit over the top to me again the, the, I, I like bro. the idea of a little figure bobblehead but I mean they've landed on something so they're not even bobbleheads their heads don't bobble you no no get that, bobble it's that concept it's that concept yeah. right it's the same size yeah. there's almost as many Funkos as there are board games released in a year <laughs> Now, the other thing I got to know is I am no huge Harry Potter fan. Um, I'm old. I didn't grow up with it. I've never read the books. I thought the movies were okay, but they sure seem to be focused on people who read the books because there were parts I didn't get. Uh, the one thing I dig about Harry Potter was the Wizarding World at Universal Studios, which was awesome. But that's mainly because it's like a big fantasy LARP thing, and it could have been D&D &D or it could have been Game of Thrones. That wouldn't have mattered to me. I just like the fact that everyone in the park was LARPing. Which is true. Like you can go to other parts of the park and ask where you can find like the train station, and people are like, "What are you talking about?" It's actually pretty well done that way. Or if you walk around with, if you buy, um, we had people bought like a familiar in the area, and you'd walk around in the real world, and people are like, "Oh my god, what is that?" It's well done. People all play along. But yeah, that's that's about it for my Harry Potter fandom. Yeah. On the other hand, my family are huge Potterheads. Books are regularly read. Movies are consistently on the tv and we have you know games of plenty uh, as well so that's it i'm not a huge fan of either of the properties in here so i'll let you know what i think about the actual game now the harry potter funko verse game plays two to four players but it's really a two-player game when you play four you're playing teams uh it's basically a miniature skirmish game uh, the basic game comes with four Funko Pop figures, Lord Voldemort, sorry, I'm not supposed to say that name, right? I should have probably edited that, Bellatrix Lestrange, Hermione Granger, and Harry Potter. Now, note, these are miniature pops. They're not the ones you see in all the stores everywhere. So this is a key detail. These are not a standard Funko Pop, which is uh, about four inches. I think it's actually three and uh, three and three quarter inch tall is the official size of a Funko Pop full size figure. Uh, these are, as far as I could tell, a pocket pop size. Okay. Um, I was surprised. There's actually about six or eight different sizes of uh, 
products Standard within pops. the well I, products within the the Funko line. Uh, it was shocking. I thought I I wasn't aware at all. But uh, a little bit of research earlier today, and uh, I, there's this range of mm-hmm. heights. So there you go. But I think it's worth noting because I know people out there that thought these were going to be games they could play with their existing pops, and that is not the case. The, these have their own miniatures. Now, along with the figures, you get four of them. You get custom dice, some cool-looking crystal point counters. Like, I kind of want to steal those. They're really nice. Uh, a bunch of cards for the characters, four scenario cards, rule book, and a bunch of counters. Uh, the set also comes with two items, which is something unique to it, where each set has different items. And I thought these were cool because there's a card for them, but they actually slot into the Pop's hands, which I thought was neat. So that was cool. This particular set gives you a potion and a dagger. So I'm assuming one for the good guys, one for the bad guys. Uh, the basic game, that like the intro game to the rule book, is just knock out the opponent's teams. Um, each player, each turn player picks a character to activate if they're two characters. Your actions are a list of standard things you'd expect, like moving, interacting with a board element, challenging an opponent. Challenging is their term for attacking. They try to keep it, I guess, kid-friendly here. Uh, assisting another character who's knocked down or reviving yourself when you're knocked down. You're going to get two of those actions a turn. Reviving actually takes both. In addition, characters have special abilities. And because this is Harry Potter, all of those special abilities are spells. And... Because this is kid friendly, I'm guessing these aren't the dark arts. No one's casting Avada Kedavra. Uh, these are more about stunning spells and knocking yeah. people out. There's no, you're not kill, you're not trying to kill people. Oh. Even if you're playing Voldemort, you're just trying to knock them out. Yeah, yes, his most powerful spell is called like Fiend Fire, and rolls six dice. It's huge, but again, yeah. it just knocks someone out. And Fiend Fire is horrifying, actually. So yeah, I was gonna say that that seems pretty bad. Uh, spells and abilities are neat because each has a number next to them and everyone has a chart, a cooldown chart that's numbered four to zero, like four, three, two, one. And when you cast a spell, you take a counter and you put it on the appropriate spot. So Fiendfire is one of the most powerful spells in the game. It goes to a four, whereas Confundo, which is one of Harry's spells, goes to two. And what that does is every round it counts down, which I thought was really neat so that you can't just keep casting your spells or in the case, if you're playing one of the other games, your other abilities over and over again. So I, while this is a fun and interesting mechanic, and I can completely understand why it's required by your game balance, it's completely sort of strange to the Potterverse. I mean, there is no there is no delay and, and wind down <laughs> at all in any magical casting in the Potterverse whatsoever. Uh, my guess it's just got to be so yeah. that, you know, I'm sure it's the same thing like Batman's Batarang probably can be used every two rounds as well, even though he probably should have any number of them. Why halfway through the battle does he remember to use them again? <laughs> now, movement is pretty typical for a standard board game. You can move orthogonally or diagonally with special rules for things like walls. Uh, there are basic line of sight rules, which are just draw a line between the, two, the middles of the hexes if a, lo- if a passes a wall, it's blocked. Uh, some powers affect the characters, um, and there's cards to represent those. Like Confundo was one where you actually hand the card to another player. Combat's all done through these challenges, and those use the unique dice. All right. So uh, once again, nothing any miniature gamer wouldn't immediately recognize and be familiar with. Yeah, as they said, it's a simple miniature battle game. Now the dice are six sided. There's three hits, two shields, and one crit. Uh, standard challenge has you roll two dice looking for hits or crits. The defender then rolls dice for defense. And these are d- different depending on which character, uh, the characters we saw Voldemort has one Bellatrix has two and the opposite Harry Potter has two and Hermione has one. Um, one of the characters has a shield spell that buffs that you're going to roll your crits. Uh, you're going to roll your hits and then you're going to roll defense shields, cancel out hits. Crits are wild. So they work for each side and they count as three. So if you roll a crit and a shield, it's actually five, four shields. If you roll more hits than shields, you knock the opponent down. If the opponent's already knocked down, you knock them out. When you knock an opponent out, you get a point. Knocked out figures go on your cooldown track for one round and then respawn. And one of the things that was neat was three of the characters in this particular set have unique respawn rules. For example, Bellatrix always respawns next to an ally. So it sounds like they've put some real thought and effort into the mechanics of this to balance the game uh, they're not just, you know, throwing a game out there that they haven't uh, thoroughly play tested. It sounds like yeah, this does seem like they got some real developers and some actual game players to make this game. This isn't one of those, as far as I can tell, terrible license games. Right. Kind of jumping ahead to final thoughts there. But there's <laughs> definitely some work I've been done in this. Now, the basic game is just about knocking each other out. Now, each set includes. 
scenarios. This one has four different scenarios you can play through. The only one I got to see on the weekend was Capture the Flag. In that scenario, in addition to getting points for knocking out your opponents, there are four crystal tokens on the map. And if you grab one of those, you get a point. And what's neat is those go on the respawn track and take four, well, five rounds. They start on four. So you can't just sit there and just keep grabbing them, which I thought was pretty cool. And then there's a flag in each player's starting area. And if you can end your turn, end the round, standing up next to an opponent's flag, you score two points. And the entire game is a race to six points. So over pretty quickly. Hey, it's a simple concept, but I actually like how that they've continued that respawning theme even through the flags uh, yeah. or, or gems or whatever they're calling them, but uh, to keep that that theme of the gameplay uh, mechanic throughout the whole game. That's that's a nice touch. Yeah, I did like that. It was well done. Uh, as I said, this is basically a simple miniature skirmish game set in pop culture settings. That's what all the Funko First games. Because in addition to Harry Potter, there's Funko First games set in Batman, or it's technically DC, but all the characters that are out are definitely Batman characters. Uh, and there's a Golden Girls set, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, what's neat is that all of the sets use the same basic rule set and they're compatible. Like there's a particular combo where you use the Joker and the Joker can drop bombs all around him. And then you back the Joker off and you bring in Rose from the Golden Girls, who then uses a power called Storytime and brings all the enemies to her into Joker's bombs. So I think it's pretty amusing that there's actually a combo between the Golden Girls and the Joker. Uh, and uh, Rick and Morty apparently get some love too in the Funkoverse. Yeah, that's true. There is. There's one of the smaller sets which just comes with two of them. So I, I basically probably got the idea at this point. I it, It's cute. I like the look of the figures. The figures are nice. Like they're, they're nice, solid chunks of plastic. I'm sure this is the same for all the Funko figures, but like you can drop them. They're not going to break. Uh, the boards are nice and clear. I, I thought that was good. You can really tell where walls are. You can tell where you move, where you can't. But man, are they small. Like I'm used to miniature games taking three by three feet, right? Like this is a very small board. I didn't count how many squares across it is, but man, you are going to end up in contact with the enemy quickly. Uh, so what I found, that's kind of cool, I guess, that you're going to hit each other quick, but it didn't leave a lot of room for maneuvering or strategy or like flanking or anything. Now, uh, because these sets are compatible, can you use multiple boards from the different sets? Well, you wouldn't be able to for the scenarios because the scenarios are based on the boards, but maybe for the basic game where you're just trying to knock your opponents out. Now, I, this is probably worth noting. At this point, I played the game a lot because I was doing demos at Comic-Con and I had the full rule book. So maybe there's something in there about adding additional sets. Okay. Uh, based on teaching it this weekend multiple times, this is a super simple to pick up game if you played any miniature gaming, like any, like pick any miniature game that's ever been published. You've played it once for an hour. You probably can pick up this game right away. Gridded movement, dice-based combat, that man, does it remind me of Hero Quest with the seal, swords and shields. Uh, really simple raids, combat rules, basic line of sight rules. It is a basic introductory skirmish war gaming game with a pop culture theme. And I got to say, this is a theme that is going to appeal to gamers and non-gamers alike. Like, I have a feeling this game is going to be a huge hit. It's not actually out yet. It doesn't come out till mid-October. Uh, this is going to be a huge hit with Harry Potter fans. I, same thing for the other games. People who dig Batman are going to be interested in the DC base set. The game is simple enough that families and non-hobby gamers are going to be able to pick it up and play it and have fun with it. They're also going to be a big hit with because, well, they're Funko Pops. So uh, Jeff mentions in the uh, lobby that uh, the rule book was harder yeah. than the game. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Like I, said, I did flip through it. I did read through it. Jeff was the one that did most. Right. And, uh, you know, people can't seem to get enough about the of their pops. Uh, if you look into any game store, whether it be a board game store, RPG store or EB games, like, you know, yep. video game store, the size of the Funko Pop display will indicate how popular the concept of pops are i mean you don't hold those kind of stock quantities if you aren't going to sell so, so we were doing demos across from a booth that's walls for pops yeah. and it, it was that's what it was it yeah. was a, a maze of pops it was insane yep so we we know all the pop fans potter fans dc fans are probably going to pick this up so what about the gamers right people like me people like us uh probably a lot of people reading uh sorry listening to this right now I personally don't think there's enough to these games to keep a gamer's interest for long. I played a lot of games on Sunday. Jeff played a lot of games on Sunday. And I gotta admit, the first couple times, it was kind of silly fun. But after about the third game, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 
I, I, I get it. I see it. There's not a lot of meat here. Uh, very high random factor with dice. And the games are so short that they're just not that rewarding. Like when I when I win, it's not like I felt like I outsmarted my opponent or I was tactically superior. I just happened to roll better. Um, I got to say, this looks fun for playing with kids and family, but th this is, I want more out of a skirmish game. Like I'm going to stick to a Warhammer Shade Spire or something else. Uh, I got to say, I think these games are going to be great for pot fans. I think they can be great gateway games for people curious about miniature games. So that's the one thing I'm kind of hoping from this as a gamer is that people try this and because of this, get interested in something like a Warhammer Shade Spire or checking out War Machine or going into the game store going, oh, do you have anything else like this that I can play that's a little more involved? And for not, those of us who have been playing games for longer, there's probably not enough here to keep you interested. Uh, Jeff in the chat room is saying, who played with you uh, on the weekend, yep. it'd be a nice gift for a Harry Potter fan who likes games, but it's not for gamers. So you yeah, know, I, mean, I didn't play with Jeff. It's just we were the two people doing demos. Yep. We never played each other. We played lots of other people, or more. Yeah. most of the time we were teaching two people to play. Uh, what is what is the age on that? Like, I'm trying to think, is this something uh, I should I, think about for Christmas for my kids? Yeah, oh. I, I don't see any reason your kids wouldn't be able to get it. Right. Especially with you being able to read the rule book and catch any of the weird nuances. Right. The, the problem is it is a skirmish war game, right? Yeah. So there are rules for adjacency, and there's rules for line of sight, and there's rules for ranged combat, right? Like, so some of the people we had doing the demos I didn't get into this in, in, in the notes is like the, there were dice there. We had so many people showed up who wanted to start their turn by rolling the dice. Cause that's what you do in a board game right. is the first thing you do is roll the dice and then you make a decision based on what the dice say. And that's every game they'd ever played. That wasn't a card game. That's how you play. Right. So this was kind of blowing their minds. So why I think this is going to be a great game for getting people into more hobby games. The fact we have people like that is, is where that comes from. It's just like, so the fact we were able to teach, I, I'm trying to think of how young the youngest person. We taught a lot of adults. So the, the there were adult fans of the franchises. I don't think we taught any real little kids, but like your kids are old enough. I Like my kids, I'm sure, would be old enough for this game. Cool. Interesting. Yeah, if they can do Hogwarts yeah. Battle, like <laughs> there's way more going on in Hogwarts Battle than this. Fair. All righty. And now, the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. All right, I got a ton of games this week. Um, I've got... Imhotep, Enemint Domain, Tyrant Cylinder, Castillo, Bonanza, Kingdom, King Domino, Funko vs. Harry Potter, Azul, and Gokuku all played this week. Most of those multiple times. All righty. <laughs> are we, uh, how are we, uh, since there's so many games to talk about this week, we're going to try and keep it a bit shorter than usual. If you do want some more info on these thoughts, head over to the blog and check out the full Tabletop Gaming Weekly article. Yeah, I'm going to try to keep it short. It'll be relatively short. I'll still, still keep the content on here. So on Monday uh, night, Tom Barker came over, longtime friend. Uh, him and Deanna and I played a handful of games. First was Imhotep. Tom had never played it before, and I thought he'd dig it. He likes those thinky filler types of games. Tom likes heavier games now and then. Since he hadn't played it, we used the A side. Really simple. Tom liked it. And in his own words, this is a good little game. Well, there really haven't been any missteps yet with this little Egyptian gem. <laughs> no, not at all. So far, we haven't had anyone not like it, actually, I, which I hadn't actually put together. Yeah, it's been going well. Uh, up next, we played Tyrants in the Underdark. Now, Tom's a big deck building fan and a D&D player, so I thought this would go well. Uh, what was interesting about this one was how much more promoting all three of us did to our decks during the game. So that's a unique mechanic in this game where you can move can cards from your deck and put them aside to score points at the end. Deanna, in particular, had a ridiculous number of cards in their inner circle by the end of the game. Now, one of the things this meant is that the area majority scoring of the board wasn't as important as previous games, which I thought was neat. Now, I think the main cause of this was we were using the draft deck this game. Now, was this your first three-player session with it or no? No, this wasn't. We had played three-player with Sean Hamilton before. The okay. first time I played was three-player as well. 
So yeah, we played three player a few times. Um, what I have yeah, I played four once. The only thing I haven't played it yet is two player. Okay. Now the last game we played with Tom was Eminent Domain. I've been playing a lot of this because I am trying to get to learn and review the Escalation expansion. The problem is Tom hadn't played this game for forever. Um, like I don't even know how many years ago, back when it came out, when I first got the game. So we stuck to the basic rules. Now, this time we did play three players. So all the other plays of Eminent Domain I've had recently have been four players. And with four players, this game's a race. Like, it is over quick. Like, you're trying to build an engine, but you're lucky if you actually get to run it. And man, that changed with three players. That was the biggest thing. This game goes on significantly longer with three, and not in a bad way. Because not only build your engine and run it, but you have some time to tweak your engine to possibly get some more points. So at this point, I got to say, Eminent Domain, thumbs up three players, and eh, with four. And, and I think we only confirm that fact, in fact, with what comes up next. <laughs> yeah, because Friday night, Deanna was away at the Pinery Camping Ground with the family. Uh, instead of streaming Gloomhaven, Kat, Tori, uh, sorry, Tori's little brother, and I played some more Eminent Domain. Uh, the first game, again, we stuck to the basic rules because I realized someone pointed out on something we had posted that we screwed up a rule in Gloomhaven, of course, or in Eminent Domain. Not a big one. Uh, it, it was a minor extreme play where we weren't allowing people to look at the other side of the cards when they use the uh, search action. Which uh, we, discovered that, how, we discovered that on BGA. That's what it was. Yeah, it was playing it on Board Game Arena. I realized you could look at it. So it wasn't a big deal, but I wanted to make sure... We were playing with the proper rules because, for one, we were streaming it. So I wanted to make sure we are playing the proper way to the stream. Um, the interesting thing about that game, though, was, again, we played three players. And, again, Tori and Kat agree with me. They're like, wow, yeah, this is better with three players. We got more stuff happened. More, we were able to do more. We bought more technology cards. The game wasn't over too quick. No, I, uh, that first game was really quite quick. Uh, in fact, with uh, without the teaching, I think it was actually under 45 wow. minutes when I did the edit. Uh, but as someone who was watching it, it didn't feel rushed. It didn't feel missing. It felt like a really good game. Yeah, that, that is the time on the box. So that man, means we managed to hit the box time of 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, after the first game, we did break out Escalation. That was their main goal for the night was to play with Escalation. We played two games. Uh, first one was just the new tech cards and the new rules and the building fleets. And the second, we used the scenario rules. Now, the basic game changes and everything uh, seem to be getting better with each play. Uh, this is definitely starting to show itself as a game that records rewards knowing the cards and multiple plays. And, man, that is showing even more with each concurrent play. The, the learning the different tech cards and what they do and why you want them is huge. Um, a highlight for our first game, though, was seeing each of us try a very different strategy and seeing that each of those seemed to be valid because we had a pretty close final score. Yeah, no, system knowledge is super important, and I don't think that can be stressed enough in this game, really. While not required, uh, I would say it is certainly mm -hmm. an advantage. And if you've got that all three players knowing the cards, it just energizes that game, and it really yeah. makes for a much more exciting game. It's almost got that, that chess feel, right? Like where you need people of a equal level to play it, to really enjoy it, yep. to, to have a really memorable good game. Now, our second game, we broke out the scenarios, and I have mixed feelings, mostly for because of what we're just talking about, because with the scenario part, uh, I want to talk a little more about this and the other stuff, because this is new to us, and it changes the starting state of the game. So everyone ends up with a scenario card, and there's different ways you can draft them. That doesn't really matter. And that's going to give you a different starting deck starting technologies and sometimes starting world sorry it's always always a different starting world different starting technologies and sometimes a different starting deck than everyone else which adds asymmetry which everyone who listens to this knows i should love asymmetry i do love asymmetry in games and i have a feeling i'm going to love it in eminent domain eventually because i felt like this game we just were not ready for it like we wasted way too much time just trying to find the stuff we were supposed to start with because we don't know the technologies that well. So we're like, do you see this? Do you know where that one was? Like, it took us time to find them. And then when we did find them, I found it really difficult to figure out how I should have been playing my deck. Like, the two starting technologies it gave me weren't, like, opposed to each other, but I couldn't seem to get the engine to use those cards well. Like, I, I love the idea of the strategy cards, but, man, I, like, 
the rule book tells you, make sure you played multiple games before you introduce introduce scenarios. But every game tells me that, right? And 99% of the time, you're like, ah, we're board gamers. We played lots of games. Let's just throw it in. Now, in this case, I think the rule book was right. Uh, I, I don't recommend using strategy cards until you are very confident that all of the players at the table already have a firm grasp of the other elements of not only the base game, but also the new stuff Escalation adds. So all in all, we're just we just keep picking up piggybacking the same idea where, you know, when it comes to eminent domain, system knowledge, system mastery is key to any sort of advancement within the game and uh, you know, mm -hmm. playing playing of the game. Yeah, this is definitely not a one and done. Like if you are looking for a bang, we're gonna play and have a great time and then not play the game for a few more months, this is not the game for you. This is something you're gonna want to get and play multiple times. Now the good thing is because it's a 45 minute time. Every time I break this game out, we play more than once. It's because there you can do that, right? You can get in two, three games. And I got to say, it's been really nice playing the same game repetitively in a short period of time and not having to relearn the rules in between. Uh, Friday night, we finished off with a very quick game of King Domino. I taught this to Tori and Kat because they were going to be at Comic-Con on Saturday, and I thought it would be a good game to show off at the con, and they hadn't played it. Um, I still dig it. They dig it. Uh, this is another one of those games where they were by the end of the game, Tori was like, Ooh, this might be a good game for my mom. Yeah, no, it's, it's a fun, easy to play, easy to learn game. And with the various different scoring options, you can tune the game for more or less experienced players. Now, while Tori and Kat were doing demos and raising money at Windsor Comic Con on Saturday, I was hosting our monthly game night at easy mode or bits and boards night. Uh, this event started off with a three-player game of Tyrants of the Underdark. Uh, at the start of the event, it was kind of lightly attended. I think a lot of people were at Comic-Con. Uh, so it was just people who had played the game before, which was nice. Uh, in this game, we tried out the Elemental deck for the first time. And I got to say, I dig it, because this adds in that mechanic that everyone knows for Star Realms, where card powers go off when you play other cards with the same aspects on them. So it's interesting. That's the only deck we, uh, out of the whole set that has a Cascade ability. Yep. Yeah, it is, it, which is weird, because each of the decks, like the, the one deck has a uh, penalty card and a defense from that penalty card. Each deck introduced to the game. Now, this game, I went heavy promotion strategy and ended up with a ridiculous pile of cards in my inner circle. If you check the blog post, you can actually see a patch picture of this. It looks like a magic deck. It's insane. Uh, overall, I'm digging tired to the other dark. The more I play, the more I'm glad to see there doesn't seem to be one way to win, which is nice. Excellent. Now, next, I taught a game of Bonanza. Uh, this was a group of new players and old pros. That game always goes over well. I'm pleased to say the new players were negotiating like pros by the end of the first round. Bean! <laughs> Gotta love Bean. Uh, finished off Saturday's event with a four-player game of Bastille. This is one I will be talking about more as time goes on. Uh, this is another game that rewards repeated plays. Now, I've already mentioned it. The, the board's awesome. It looks aesthetically awesome. It's so easy to read. I love the symbols. But man, the end game scoring and what you should be spending your turns on and how often you should be upgrading is so opaque. Uh, which citizens you, you should buy. This was really evident because two of us had played before and two were new. And the two of us had played before like crushed the two new players. This is another eminent domain effect, we almost could call it at this point, where you got to play it multiple times, and the people who do are going to do better than new players. Which It's always interesting to see which games you can sit down and uh, and just play, you know, the rules are all on the cards, it doesn't matter, uh, and then which games where you just need to know what's going on. Yeah, and this is definitely one. Like um, I was told that this is a hidden gem by Queen Games, and I'm starting to see why. This is not going to win anyone over on a first play. It's just not that kind of game. For the era of one and done, which is what we're in right now as far as board games are concerned, games like Bastille are just not going to make it. Now, if you're a player who likes games where you can master them and learn them and memorize the cards and the decks and card count and get into the higher strategies, this may be a game for you. <clears throat> now, this brings us to Sunday. Sunday, I spent all day at Windsor Comic Con doing demos, raising money for Extra Life. We already talked about this. Uh, went well, raised over 200 bucks, which is awesome. 
big thank you to the CG Realm because they donated two games for us to raffle. One of which was that Harry Potter game I reviewed earlier, and that got a lot of people to the table. That was awesome. That was a great incentive for people to donate. So thanks, Jeremy, for that. Yeah, no, it's when when you've got a game like that, especially one that people cannot get their hands on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a it's a big way to to bring people in. What's funny is some of the other Funko vendors came over and entered just so they could get a copy to have at their booth, which I thought was funny. <laughs> uh, during the event, Jeff Seuss, patron of the show and in our chat room right now, we're doing demos all day. I did a couple demos of Azul as well as teaching quite a few kids how to play Go Cuckoo. The big draw, though, was that Funko Pop Harry Potter game. And I just told you all about that one. So I'm not going to repeat it here. Uh, I got to admit, there was not a lot of time at the con when that game wasn't getting played, except right at the beginning beginning of the day where we hadn't really figured it out if the game was being played people would gather around and get in line to play again that that game drew attention all right well how about a look ahead what do you have planned for the coming week Uh, This Saturday is our Level Up with Extra Life charity RPG event at the CG Realm, so I'm looking forward to playing some RPGs. Uh, If we have enough players there, I might run something, but right now I think I'm just going to fill in holes if there are any. Uh, The week after that, though, I'm going to be prepping for the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz, uh, making sure I'm up on my rule knowledge before we get to that tournament. Uh, were you not doing WWE or was that somebody else arresting WWE? You know what? There's The problem is not enough people have signed up on the Facebook event and we have no idea how many people are going to go. And I don't want to steal people from the tables that already don't have enough players because I hadn't actually created WWE or sorry, WWW Worldwide Wrestling. No, we yep, yep. either get, get Nathan in trouble if we call it <laughs> WWE. Uh, I didn't actually put it as an event. So I am going to be there. And if there's a flood of people, I'll run it, but if there isn't, I'll sit at someone's table to, so that to fill their table. Alrighty. Uh, and uh, where are we going here? I'm going to yep. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Sean P. Kelly, who puts the S in gaming and BS. Thank you. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark. Join Phil, Chris, Bob every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Roger Malosh. Thank you. Well, that was the double bell. Yeah, that means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued effort, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30 We mostly play Gloomhaven, but now and then we'll surprise you with something else. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show and our new tradition of raiding another tabletop gaming Twitch streamer at the end of the night. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. Good night.